All right, here we go on another one. Um, again, I'm joined by Ben Payless. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. And here we are talking about Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Uh, New York Times bestseller, David Goggins is a freak of nature, to put it lightly. He, he uh, best known for his time in the SEAL teams, but he also is the only person to do both SEAL and Ranger training and, and to complete both of those trainings. So his book is essentially his life story, uh, and he talks about where he grew up, which was pretty horrific, and the way he grew up. Uh, eventually him and his mom kind of went off on their own, were very poor, the only black kid in a white neighborhood at times, um, and then eventually found these ways of sort of accomplishing great things through physical feats, and, and that was the path he took to a lot of healing and strength and inspiration. So before we jump in, I want to add that I listened to the audiobook, which is not typical for me. I usually try and read all the books that we that we review here, but this one I listened to the audiobook and it was pretty phenomenal. The way he does it is he actually has his ghostwriter reading the book and they do it kind of like a podcast almost. So they'll read like a chapter or two chapters and then they'll stop and just have a chat and David will add more context to the chapter they just read and uh, additional stories and things like that. So I would recommend the audio book as well with this one. So I'll put the links in the show notes so you can purchase the book or the audio book from Amazon or slash Audible there. So Ben, what was your take on the book? So I'm always fascinated by people like this who are able to push themselves to the ult ultimate extremes. Uh, and, and so that is definitely what, uh, what Goggins has, has done. Um, and, you know, I, I, I listened to him, uh, on a couple of Rogan's podcasts, um, and, and, you know, heard some other things about him through, uh, other, other social media and on other podcasts that I've listened to. Um, but the, the, the book itself is pretty amazing. Not only you know, did I learn more things about him and where he came from, what he did, um, but also how he overcame um, all his, his not, not, not only his past, but also his mental instabilities overcame that from, from when he was growing up. So, I mean, it's really, really fascinating read. Um, and I'll tell you that the reason I was holding up the book too is because it's a cool cover too. So you can see kind of the outline of, the old Goggins at 300 plus pounds compared to the stud ultra marathoner right now. So dressed in his Navy whites. Yep. Dressed in the whites. Yeah. Yeah. That is a cool cover. So the way the book's set up is he, he actually, he'll tell the story. And then at the end of the chapters, he has a challenge for you. And these are things that he kind of figured out through life. This is like a book of hard knocks and lesson learned kind of thing. And so, uh, he gives you the challenges to take analysis of yourself and try and um, apply his principles to your own life. So one of the things that I really enjoyed about this is that is that Goggins gives you ideas to to think about. So I, I wanted to to read just an excerpt from here about some things to think about. So it starts off with this: What am I capable of? I couldn't answer that question. But as I looked around the finish line that day and considered what I'd accomplished, it became clear that we are all leaving a lot of money on the table without realizing it. We habitually settle for less than our best at work, in school, in our relationships, and on the playing field or race course. We settle as individuals and we teach our children to settle for less than their best. And all of that ripples out, merges and multiplies within our communities and society as a whole. We're not talking some bad weekend in Vegas, no more cash at the ATM kind of loss either. At that moment, the cost of missing out on so much excellence in this eternally screwed up world felt incalculable to me, and it still does. I haven't stopped thinking about it since. And to me, that kind of summed up what he's figured out about life in, 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 in the whole. And 
it just it it makes me think a lot about after reading this you know what am i actually capable of you know bronze what are you capable of what are all all of us capable of that none of us are striving to get to what we can actually do so you know without jumping in too too deep um you know he has a uh, a, a rule that he's come up with called the 40 percent rule where even when we think that we're all giving a hundred percent we're only giving 40 percent we're leaving 60 percent on the table and he's right <laughs> he's right as you were reading the intro i immediately thought of his 40 percent rule and how when i heard him talk about the 40 percent rule i was kind of like like i know we leave stuff on the table and i've you know i've spent far too many evenings on my phone or watching netflix or uh whatever but um i always thought like you know most people are probably given like 70 80 <laughs> percent you know you're the 80 20 rule or whatever but like 40 percent. he says we're leaving 60 percent on the table like we're leaving the majority of our potential untapped which when you think of that in the context of human existence across the globe if we're only actually tapping 40 percent, now you know it's not like fact but um what he's achieved versus typical people at least in like his physical endurance races and navy seal training and stuff like that i mean it kind of kind of shows it you know that we're leaving an enormous amount of ourselves completely untapped. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that really struck me in this book. So, you know, I know, I know myself, heck, and I, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, right, we know that most of us leave a, a lot on the table it, it, no matter what we're trying to do. And, and I don't just mean around, you know, work, you know, because, hey, that's that's a little give and take relationship, right? We give a lot of times what we think that we're compensated for. And so maybe there's some reason to leave some stuff on the table there, right? If you don't exactly, you know, like where you're at or know where you're going in your in your profession. But, you know, when I when I'm thinking about this physically and when he describes what he went through or pushed his body to. I, I think of some of the menial things that I've done physically and and always knew that well there's a little bit more left in the tank but when you read about what he was able to push his body to and it wasn't because you know you you at the beginning said that you know he's a he's a freak of nature which i think he is but i don't think he's a physical freak of nature i think mentally he's a freak of nature because he's figured out how to use his mind to overcome his body. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going way back right into high school and, and thinking about that, you know, in the weight room and on the field, uh, our, our coaches would always say your mind is strong or sorry, your, your body is strong. Your mind is weak. And that stuck with me throughout my, my whole life because they were exactly right. Your body is capable of so much more if you can get your mind to figure out that, hey, it's only pain and, and it doesn't really matter. That feedback loop of pain makes you think that, hey, this isn't worth it. And then you talk yourself into stopping. Where he's figured out a way to allow his mind to overcome what his body is telling him and push through it. And it's amazing what he's been able to accomplish because his, he's trained his mind like that. And he, he compares that to the governor on a car, on a vehicle, where like we sort of have this built-in mechanism that sort of says, oh, we're starting to get a little bit of pain, discomfort, fear, caution, whatever, right? Like there's a, there's a bunch of ways that we tell ourselves like we should probably stop now and or, or don't pursue this dream, goal, passion, athletic potential, whatever it is. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of mechanisms in our body that say like, eh, kind of ease up or that's enough, good enough for today. And he challenges us all to basically say, you know, work on removing that governor as it pertains to things that you're trying to accomplish, right? Stop listening to the voices, the negativity, even the pain. Sometimes there's a difference between true injury and 
pain of like I'm tired or, or tuckered. Right. It's like, yeah. um, you know, your muscles can start cramping or whatever. And it's like, you, you kind of find a way to keep driving, even take a small break and then keep driving. Like, uh, but don't just call it quits early in the book. He's, he's talking about, uh, his routine when he finally decided to get going in the Navy SEALs, right? And he was going to lose all that weight and pass the test and everything. Um, he would do a workout. And if he, if he like cut it short, he bought into the weakness, he would freaking drive back and do the entire workout over again to prove to himself that he's not a quitter. You know, and, and that's the kind of mentality that so many of us lack. We kind of go, I got, I got a little bit in, so I'm good. But he was like, no, I know what I had to do. And if I didn't do it, I went back and made damn sure that it happened. So let's let's start from the beginning and talk about his childhood, because I think that's significant with where he ends up. Because, you know, um, you, you see freak athletes or or you know, high performers. And it seems like sometimes they have a demon in them that, that they're fighting. And that's definitely true for Goggins. But it towards the end of the book, he almost seems like he has found peace. And that's, um, that's an interesting journey from where he began, where he goes. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's so interesting to me because what he went through as a, as a child, with his father uh and then once they got out of that situation and when, what he went through as a you know an adolescent and and teenager i think if most of us took a look at that you know we would give anybody a pass on what they turned out to be you know and i, I think we do that all the time right if somebody mm -hmm. grows up in the type of situation that that he did and then made some major life mistakes right that put them down a path that none of us would want to be on. We would give those people a, a pass being, well, you know, look at the way that he grew up, look at the things they had to go through. Of course he turned out that way. But just the amazing right. thing with him is that he was able to train his mind to overcome that. So, so just to, to, to start this off. So he grew up um, out on the, out on the East coast, um, with a, a, a father who, to put it bluntly, was an asshole. Um, <laughs> just not a good guy at all. So That's putting it light. Yeah, so, you know, his, his dad, you know, um, ran some legitimate businesses as well as several not legitimate businesses. Um, but then terrorized his wife and his kids, so, so David and his brother, terrorized them every day as well. So one of his legitimate businesses that he had is he owned a, a skating rink. Um, you know, and this is back in the, uh, uh, if I'm getting it right, the late seventies, early eighties. Uh, and so he would, he would force his wife and kids to go work at the skating rink, you know, all late afternoon, evening or late afternoon into the evening to get stuff prepped and set up. And then work as people came to a skate at the skating rink. And then he had a bar up above. And so, you know, his mom was forced to go work in the bar up above. And they were there all night long because then they had to do cleanup and everything. And, and so, you know, uh, David is a, you know, six, seven, eight year old kid and his older brother would get home throughout the week at like six in the morning. Then they had to go to school, right? And try to figure out how to function at school and, and do everything that the rest of us would do normally. Uh, so that took place for a series of years. And then his dad, of course, was, uh, you know, physically abusive to uh, he and his brother and his mom as well. Um, and then eventually mom got tired enough of it to find a way to, to get out. So they got out threw everything in the car and, and drove out to Indiana um, to go, live with, uh, where, where her parents were at. So, um, I don't know, is there, is there anything that you want to kind of add in there to the first part of his life to give a little bit of backstory? Yeah. So he, he, the fact that his father was so abusive, uh, and belittling to these, to, to all of them, but he, he felt like he was maybe kind of the primary target because his older brother, 
uh, was the eldest and kind of enamored by his father. And so uh, David, on the other hand, was kind of the runt, the one that that was not looked at as a strong person, the way he talked to him. But also they had this image of a successful put together family on the outside, right? His dad drove a Corvette and they lived on a nice street in a nice neighborhood. But on the inside of the house, it was a completely different story. At one point, he accidentally set off the house alarm while his dad was sleeping. His dad came down with a gun. And instead of seeing that it was his son and putting the gun down, he pointed at right between his eyes for, uh, you know, extended period of time. And then finally put the gun down and went to bed again. And it's like, what kind of person does that to a little kid, you know, not much less his own son. Right. So it was just, um, it was so bad that, that they literally were getting to the point where he says frequently in his audio book, he's like, definitely someone was going to die or go to jail in that house. And that was at the point when his mom left. In fact, there, he, he had some context in the audio book about there was actually some planning going on between various people around them, uh, to oust his dad to kill him. Yeah. So something bad was going to happen and his mom, you know, figured out a way to get out. So such a horrible environment to grow up and and you know, anytime you hear of anytime you've known or or heard of like these, you know, abused children, they don't they don't typically turn out to be really, you know, high achievers. Uh they usually end up in jail or abusive themselves, right? And so it's like and as you said earlier, it's like we give them a pass because it's like, yeah, they're freaking jacked up. And um, so to see where this all began for David and and his mom is heartbreaking. But then, I mean, as he says, every challenge, it makes the story better. You know, one other thing to, to remember is he he did get officially diagnosed with some learning disability, which made his elementary and high school years difficult too. So at first when he was young, like school was the place where he was protected, but eventually as it became harder and harder and more, you know, the standard was raised, he also felt inadequate there too. So it, it became a, you know, his, his whole life was this big exhausting turmoil that he he eventually had to find a way out yeah and so you know they were able to escape that situation and move to indiana um but that put them in another another bad spot as well so you know it, i i think you know all of us can imagine all right um you know young mother um now single you know, without a work history because dad wouldn't let her work outside the home, you know, not much education. Um, well, in fact, no education. So, you know, think of her prospects of, of now being single and the sole breadwinner and, and having to try to go out and, and live on her own. So, you know, they were on, they were on welfare and I'm trying to remember the dollar amount that they were paying for their, uh, for their apartment per month. I, it was like $7, I want to say. Uh, so subsidized, very subsidized housing, you know, to allow them to, to get by. And, and, and what kind of struck me next in this, um, in this part of his life is that, so they, they moved out to Southern Indiana and, uh, it's, it's a place that I, I lived for, uh, for two years as well. So I under, understand that area and what it's like. And he talks about you know, himself being the only, right? Because he was the only, uh, only African American kid in his school, right? Um, you know, so I, I can't even imagine number one, being in that situation, but also knowing the area that he was in is, uh, is pretty racist. You know, when I was there in the early 90s, there was just a lot of racial tension. And if anybody knows kind of some of the history of, of Indiana and the, the KKK, you know, he mentions that the KKK was still active and, you know, had marched in a, in a parade um, in the town that he, he lived in like a year or two before he got there, you know, and I, and I remember the exact same thing, like, holy cow, like the KKK is literally still active 
you know, in the early nineties in some of these towns, there's a little town called, called Elwood. And, and if you, if you live there, I guess my condolences a little bit, but you know, there was some bad stuff going on. You know, there was, you know, talks of lynchings that had happened, you know, only 20 years before, you know, and the KKK is still very relevant and burning crosses in, in people's yards. And so for him to be the only black kid having to go to school, right, with some of that influence around him, that's that's tough. Right. Yeah, in fact, he, he does share a few stories um, about that where he and his buddy were walking home late after like a party and a truck stops and somebody yells a racial slur out the window and then the truck backs up and they get out with a gun. And yet again, he's got someone pointing a gun at him and, you know, tell it like, um, a girl that he actually ended up marrying down the road. He's sitting at lunch with her and, and her dad, uh, walks over and says, I never want to see you sitting with this, this kid again, but he throws out the ultimate racial slur there too. Right. And so it's like, he's, he's getting this from adults, from kids, from, from different, every source around him. So he just keeps getting these messages through his entire youth. that like, you're worthless. You're not worthy. You deserve to be kind of thrown aside. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, is it, definitely having a tough time in school because of all that. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I, and I think once again, you know, I, I went back to, you know, if, if, if things would have turned out differently, right. Let's say, you know, David Goggins ends up in jail, you know, and then on, on welfare for a large part of his life, you know, a lot of us give him a pass because of what he went through. That's where, yeah. Like, I mean, he says it himself. He's like, I should have been a statistic. Should have just been like another one on welfare or in jail. Right. Um, or even killed because, uh, that kind of childhood usually does not result in, you know, successful upstanding people. Right. And in fact, there's a book that I read years ago called helping children succeed. And this guy's um, last, you know, 15, 20 years of work was trying to figure out like, why do certain students excel and certain students don't in both environments uh, like, you know, poor economically challenged communities, versus you know upscale communities and like and the same factors apply it's people who feel loved and supported at home do well in school like that's that's pretty much um the what he's reduced it to and so like a lot of his work is trying to figure out how to help single mothers like do all these jobs they've got to do and help parents connect with their children and help children feel supported both in school and at home and all this stuff. Right. And so it's like, so when you think of it in that context, like David Goggins was on that side, like his mom was always solid for him, but his dad was horrible. The community was not, not great for him in, in most of his life. And, and so um, he, you know, he says to himself, I should have been a, a statistic. So, so anyway, this, this results, he, he ends up finding uh, a passion for like the air force. He wanted to be a pararescue um, in, in the air force. And so he works his way into that, uh, you know, shortly after high school and stuff, but then kind of gets an out um, and he, he ends up quitting that. So then he ends up as a, like, an exterminator or whatever, right? He's spraying for cockroaches and setting traps for mice, whatever, in restaurants and commercial buildings. And this is where his story really begins to change, right? And that's the picture of him on the cover where it's, it's like 300 pounds and, and he's, you know, he's overweight. He's not happy. His routine is pretty unhealthy. He like, he basically goes out after all these businesses have closed. So he's working kind of the night shift. He's sucking down milkshakes and burgers like with frequency. He describes his diet at one point and it's like, I mean, he's he's eating thousands of calories and his, yet his lifestyle 
does not require that kind of, you know, so he, he's, he's pretty unhealthy. He's depressed at least to a degree. And, um, and, you know, he says, you know, it's honest work, what he was doing. It's not like he was, he's bagging on that situation as far as what he was doing, but it just was not fulfilling to him. His marriage wasn't great, or maybe even it was depressed thinking about divorce at that point and separated from his wife. And um, so this is where it gets real. But there was one one quote in here that I had to say, and this is how he described himself uh, as he's sitting on his couch um, thinking about where he's at after he had a horrible night at work. <laughs> and he goes, they say there's light at the end of the tunnel, but not once your eyes adjust to the darkness. And that's what happened to me. I was numb, numb to my life, miserable in my marriage, and I'd accepted that reality. I was a wannabe warrior turned cockroach sniper on the graveyard shift, just another zombie selling his time on earth, going through the motions. In fact, the only insight I had into my job at that time was that it was actually a step up. I I love the whole, like, just another zombie selling his time on earth, right? Which is what a lot of people are doing. And that's why he says the 40% rule. Like if you're just going to work to collect a paycheck begrudgingly and going home to try and make it through another day, like that, you know, what value, what uh, honor, what like self-fulfillment are you, are you leaving on the table? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's, it's, I know it's, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, the first half, I don't know, the first part of his life, right, is, is just, it's dark, right? It's, it's, it's dismal. Yeah. He gave himself a little bit of a, of a path when he entered the Air Force, but then he allowed that really to go to crap because he decided it, it, it kind of wasn't worth it. He was given an out. Um, and, and, and he took it because of fear, right? He was afraid, afraid to complete um, what he had to do in order to become a, 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 a para jumper, you know, with working in the water because, you know, he describes that he's, you know, has, has some negative buoyancy, you know, and um, anyway, it was given out because of, of, of sickle cell. So he took it and then, you know, got caught up in, you know, and he talks about um, eating those tens of thousands of calories you know, and bulking up, hitting the gym, but, you know, allowing himself to become fat to hide himself, you know, to hide actually who David Goggins was. And then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the next part about how, you know, you can see all of a sudden something clicked in him. There, there was a light, I guess, that was inside that was finally ignited. And he was watching TV and a commercial came on, right? I'm getting this right, right? It was a commercial about uh, about the Navy and becoming a, a Navy SEAL. Yeah, so it was when those it was when those documentaries were on the Navy SEALs. He was just like jumping in the shower, and he heard the commercial come on or the show, and he he describes it. He's like, I threw a towel around my waist, but I was so fat that it couldn't hardly even fit around me. I ran out there to see these, like the baddest dudes on earth. Right. And that just like got to him. He just like, he, he always liked the Rocky shows. And he was like, he loved this idea of like an underdog just becoming the baddest man alive, you know? And so that, that sucked him in. Yeah. So, you know, so imagine this, right. And, and imagine yourself, you're, you're an exterminator working a graveyard shift. You know, you become so unhealthy that you gained over a hundred pounds. So you're now sitting at, at like 300 and it was like 306 or 309 pounds. All of a sudden a commercial comes on and something clicks inside your brain that, you know what? I want to become the hardest, baddest man on earth and I'm going to do it. And just that turn, just, I mean, it really struck me. Right. And you're, and, and so I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, fine. You know, people think that, but then once they get punched in the face again, are they able to continue on or do they fold? So I just, I wanted to read that, that next part about, 
when he got punched in the face right after that. So he saw this thing about the seals. He decided, that's me. I'm going to become one of the baddest men on earth. And so he quit his job. And let me just read this. It says, I didn't go back inside that restaurant. I didn't collect my gear. I started my truck, stopped for a chocolate shake, my comfort tea at the time, and drove home. It was still dark when I pulled up. I didn't care. I stripped off my work clothes, put on some sweats, and laced up my running shoes. I hadn't run in over a year, but I hit the streets ready to go four miles. I lasted 400 yards. My heart raced. I was so dizzy, I had to sit down on the edge of the golf course to catch my breath before making the slow walk back to my house, where my melted shake was waiting to comfort me in yet another failure. I grabbed it, slurped, and slumped into my sofa. My eyes swelled with tears. So once again, I think he does what many of us would do, right? He gave up again. He got punched in the face and he said, this, this sucks. I can't do it. And he went home. But then he had some, some drive. And I'm going to say he's probably in his DNA, right? He's got some drive, though, that he's like, this, this can't be it. I have to get out of the situation I, I'm in. And so what did, he do? what did he do? The same thing all of us should do. You watch Rocky. <laughs> you put Rocky in. <laughs> you listen to some badass music. And you go out there and get it together. Right. And, and shortly after this, he, so then he, he went back out, right? He was like, after he watched Rocky, he went back out for a run and he actually pushed through and he ran hard and, and everything. And he said, by the time I stopped to look at my watch, I had ran over a mile. And that was one of his first realizations of like, I can like maybe pain, maybe these registers in our body that say like, stop are actually just like um, caution signs that come too early. They're the governor. They're the safety mechanism that um, often don't apply to the world we live in now, right? It's one thing when it's a caution sign because a big bear or tiger is going to eat you if you leave the, the hut at night. But in the modern world, we apply these same like safety mechanisms to things like going for a jog or getting on that business meeting or trying to start the business. And like it, it, you know, it, it screws us up. It makes us weaker and less effective. It's so much. Right. And that was his first moment where he's like, Hmm, pain stopped me the first time. But when I pushed through that threshold, I was able to do twice as much. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so, you know, as, as as part of this process, then of course, so he goes to see a uh, a, a navy, well, a bunch of navy recruiters. Started calling, started emailing, you know, and all of them laughed at him and told him, "No, you're you're not going to become a navy seal," until he found one guy, you know, who was willing to work for it. And, and so this this navy recruiter found a program that he was able to enter, and so said, "Yeah, yeah, come on down to the office, you know, let's figure this out." So Goggins comes down to the office. He weighs him in, finds out that he has to lose a minimum of 106 pounds. And you're like, whew, that's a, that's a tall order, you know? I mean, like, what does he have, like, a year, 18 months to do this? No. He has 92 days. Right. 92 days to lose 106 pounds. But the recruiter believes in him, gets him signed up to be able to do this. Oh, yeah, and then, by the way, because like he had cheated his way through through school through life growing up so he didn't he didn't learn a heck of a lot right and so he had to retake the asfab test and, and and score really well in one section to be able to get into uh um you know the uh the the pre-course to go to buds so he has to do all this in in just 90 days and it's just it's just crazy so then he talks about, okay, well then it's time to get to work. Yeah, man. He, he, um, uh, that's that journey of going from, you know, overweight 300 and some pounds to 
you need to lose 106 pounds plus retake this test and do better than you've ever done. <laughs> I mean, like he, he does have some like mental switch that, that very few people come with. Cause even in his weakest moments, he was like still driven, it, it, which is pretty incredible. And so he did do that. He, he lost, he didn't even start working out immediately. He started studying first. And then, um, and he said the weight loss would have to come later, but then he gets himself on this extreme workout slash diet and does it day after day, uh, where he's running miles, swimming two hours a day, studying while riding a stationary bike, a cheap bike he bought from Walmart, <laughs> sitting there studying and riding for hours, you know, and, um, he, he accomplishes it, man. He hit that first goal, which just, just that to get, to lose the weight and study and pass the test is a bigger feat than a lot of people have ever really challenged themselves to. Right. And that's only the beginning for him. No. And, that, and that's the thing. That's not, that's not even, I mean, that's really just to get him to step a, right. That's not even to B. that was just to get him to screening. Right. I, just to, to screening. And then he's got to go through everything at, you know, at, at, at screening to be able to class up to, to go to buds. So, you know, so, so he does that, he completes it. He passes, you know, the ASFAB with a, you know, a score good enough to get him to screening. You know, he loses the weight, um, takes off. Go, well, I guess we should, we should say as well, has to come to the realization that he and his wife are going to get a divorce. Um, so leaves his wife as well goes down to San Diego, um, you know, to, to class up for, for buds and, and starts that routine, um, of, you know, the hardest military training on earth, um, in, in buds. So, you know, I, I think by this time, I'm sure he had it in his mind that everything that he's gone through already, there is no way that he would ever quit. So, um, starts buds and then gets to, uh, gets to hell week. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, if you, if you know anything about the Navy and the SEALs, you know what Hell Week is. So we won't go into a, a whole lot there. But he ends up uh, getting pneumonia, I believe, right, the first time? Yep, that's correct. Yeah, so um, gets pneumonia and ends up having to, uh, to, to get rolled back. Yep. So he gets rolled back the first time, goes back in the second time, and... Um, he, he wasn't a hundred percent right yet, but you know, you got a limited amount of time to get this done. So he goes through the second one and, uh, he, uh, had a bit of experience from the first one. So he actually, I, I can't remember if this is in the book or if this is the extra, but he actually stole a bunch of Motrin <laughs> and hit it in the sand. <laughs> and so as he, as he was going through the hell week again and his knee was jacked up and all this stuff and he starts to have problems. He details them out in the book, but he, he starts having like real physical problems, but he's just pushing through. <laughs> so he's, he's down in these Motrin as he's out there in the sand and stuff. So he said he was taking like nine a day, which is way more than you're you know supposed to have. But, um, and so he makes it through hell week, uh, as, and his whole team, made it through his whole boat boat crew or whatever and um so they didn't lose a single guy through that he was their leader and um he he starts getting this mentality of like what he calls taking people's souls and like basically he he put himself at at war with his instructors where he was like you're trying to get to me well i'm trying to get to you by showing no weakness right and he's he's this is where uh, some point you're like this guy's a freaking psycho like he just has this his so many levels of like intensity above the normal person where he's just like i will prove to everybody i'm the baddest man on the planet and uh it gets it's just so inspiring but also just like i don't know i was just like i don't even know what to think of this guy he's intense um but he ends up after Hell Week, having to exit the program again 
due to his knee. Um, so he had a jacked up knee that, that caused him to get kicked out of buds again. You know, so here we are again. So he keeps getting these huge obstacles placed in front of him. Um, you know, so where we're at now is that he's, he, he's gone through, you know, two different classes of, of, of buds training has made it through two different hell weeks. And now they're sending him home for a year to go hill up, telling him that he can come back and try again. And myself, I can't, I can't even imagine that thinking that this is where you're at and you're going to have to come back and start over again at day one. Right. So uh, just, you know, thinking that, okay, you've got this goal, you've, you've accomplished so much just to get you to that point, but there keeps getting these huge obstacles that, that are placed in your way and you have to keep overcoming these huge obstacles. And now here's another one that you're going home for a solid year and yeah, you can come back and try it again, but you don't get to, you know, you don't get to start up where you left off. No, you're starting at day one again. So he goes home and, you know, has some stuff happen at home, um, reconciles with his, with his wife unexpectedly. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then has to come back and, and, and try it again. So. So the interesting po- thing in, in his story, as he, the way he tells it is like when he, hits certain points along the way. He's like, man, I've, I've overcome my past at least to, you know, he, he sort of thinks that. And then when he goes home and, you know, falls back into old habits and hooks up with his, uh, ex-wife actually, and, um, ends up, you know, she ends up pregnant and he's just like, oh my gosh, like I haven't changed at all. I haven't beaten any of this. Right. And he starts really thinking about how, like, I'm still afraid of all the same stuff. I still buy into the old same patterns. And he starts really taking, uh, you know, agenda here and, and looking at his life and saying like, what's the solution? What's the way through this, you know? Um, and, and so I think that's where he starts to turn from, I can't just be, the toughest Navy SEAL or whatever, I got to really work on some of these things that have kind of held me back or old routines, you know? Um, so he, he recognizes he hasn't changed like he thought he had. And he's really thinking about like, do I want to be a Navy SEAL again? And, and, you know, try it, try it all again. Or do I want to find another path? Now he's got, now his, his ex-wife is pregnant and he's got a family to think about all this stuff. And in the end, he, he's on the phone with the, um, whoever it is at buds, he has to give final decision. And he says, yeah, count me in again. So he goes for round three. Uh, he's already been through, through two hell weeks and, uh, and all the training he did with the paratrooper thing. And now here he goes round three with buds and you can only do it three times. If you fail the third time you're out and, and failure can mean anything from, from injury to just ringing the bell and quitting. Right. So, uh, this is it. This is it for him. Yeah. Got one more try. Yeah. Yeah. So not only, you know, getting injured or ringing the bell and, you know, taking yourself out, the instructors could let you go all the way through and then decide, a day before graduation that, yeah, you're not quite what they want. And so then they'll boot you out. So there's so many ways that he could wash out. But I think the point of it is that he realizes this is the last chance for him. You know, can, can he do it? So he starts it up all over again. Class. I got to read this little bit. He says about it, right? He's like, he says, uh, Life had put me in the fire, taken me out and hammered me repeatedly and diving back into the Bud's cauldron, filling a third hell week in a calendar year would decorate me with a PhD in pain. I was about to become the sharpest sword ever made. (laughs) 
that's his freaking approach to it, man. It's like PhD in pain, you know? And it's like, some of us would be like, ah, I, I went through hell week at Bud's and that makes me one of the few, but no, he's like, I'm going to do the third for the third time in one year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good stories about, you know, his, his third try, his, his third attempt. Um, he ends up getting injured again, right? Some of the old injuries crop back up, but he, he hides them. This time. It, so, so he says his knee wasn't quite right when he got back. And this time his shins, like he's getting like uh, little fractures in his, in his tibia, fibula, fibula, I guess. And um, he's like wrapping them in socks and tape and all this stuff, trying duct to figure tape. out how to keep going. Yeah. Duct tape to get through hell week. Yeah. So, you know, so he, he, he does it and there's a lot of good stories in there, um, you know, about, uh, you know, getting through hell week, but that's still only, you know, first phase. Um, you know, you get to replace your, your, your white shirt with the brown shirt, but you've still got another six months of training, right? So you've got to get through phase two and phase three. So he's got a couple of good stories in there about pool competency, um, and what he has to do to get through that. Um, but, you know, he, uh, you know, like you talked about that he, he makes the instructors and, and one instructor in particular that I think he calls psycho, if I remember right. Um, you know, he finds something within himself to try to still psycho's soul. And so, you know, they go mano y mano and Goggins wins. Um, so, you know, he, he, he's finding ways mentally to overcome the physical issues that he has. So then I think there he's really starting to figure it out, right? Is that your body's strong, strong, your mind is weak. And if you can overcome your mind, well, then your body can do amazing things. So he ends up getting through, you know, phase two, phase three, and then uh, finally gets to graduate buds and uh, go on to get his trident. Right. So now he finally, he, he made it through, man. Like when he was sitting on that couch, 300 pounds, and he decided he was going to be a, a Navy SEAL and he started calling recruiters, you know, a lot of them laughed at him because they're like, man, we've seen athletes and, and, you know, some of the toughest dudes around show up for buds and just like give up. And now we're, you know, you're this, 300 pound exterminator nursing on chocolate milk that y y you know you're gonna be a navy seal is like come on come on right and now the dude freaking did it man not only did he do it he did it he he did you know three rounds of hell week and 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 made it happen you know one thing about this book that's that i found pretty inspiring very cool about david is he's done all these amazing things but he's also failed at many of them over and over. Right. And a big lesson learned is like, listen, you, you don't know what's ahead of you. And, and so therefore you may be a little un, underprepared. Um, but you push as hard as you can do as well as you can and then regroup and try again, you know, and we're talking about things from, from this point forward in the book, talking about things that most humans have never even experienced or, or wouldn't even want to experience, right? Ultra runs, buds training, ranger training, like some of the hardest physical feats, uh, that, that people even do. And, and he, he fails at a bunch of them, but he picks himself up. He replans, he re, uh, calibrates and he goes back. He freaking goes back in for more over and over and over. And that's what makes David Goggins the hardest man alive. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it's, it, to, to me, it's just, it, it's so impressive because like I said earlier, it's not that physically, he's the most gifted guy on the face of the earth, but he's found a way through training his mind to overcome all of the physical pain 
or physical detriment that he has to be able to do anything that he wants. And that, that just really has struck me because when you think about, you know, all of the just complete stud athletes who haven't trained their mind correctly and they fail at the types of things that Goggins has excelled at, not because that they're, you know, not more gifted athletes, they are, but it's because they haven't trained their minds right. And that's the, that's the most impressive thing to me is that he's been able to do, you know, to, to be able to reconcile things in his brain that pain no longer matters. And to me, that's just, it's absolutely amazing. It's hard to comprehend, right? It's like, I, you know, I thought I was a fairly good athlete and made it to the college level and uh, made some people look like wimps in, at that level. But like, he just takes it to just like so many levels beyond, man. It's like, it makes me look at my life and go like, damn, I've wasted, <laughs> I've wasted so many years <laughs> just uh, pretending. You know, which is, I think, what we do, and that's yeah. one of his points in his book is like we we live in we live in comfort, and we allow ourselves to accept that as like a good life. Uh, but he challenges everyone to, you know, get the hell off your ass and go go give more, dude. He he talks about um, he talks about how he he believes in God and that. He likes to think that God has this list of things we were supposed to accomplish on this earth. <laughs> and that when he gets there, even God himself will be like, dang, you did more than I ever thought. Right? Like, that's how, <laughs> that's where his mind is at. Like, it, it's like incomprehensible to me. Yeah. Like, he's trying to beat God's expectations. Like, um, just a wild, a wild freaking ride with this guy. And he's only like in his forties at this point. Right. Right. Not in at this point in the book, at this point, as of today, right. Yep. In the book where we've only gotten, we've only gotten halfway through the book at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe let's, 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 let's talk about maybe some of the, the ultra marathons and things for, for a couple minutes. So, you know, he's a, he's a Navy SEAL he deployed, um, you know, doing the things that you're sp supposed to do as an active member of the military. Um, he then wants to help raise money um, to, to help support uh, families of, of, of SEALs and uh, um, other special forces that, are, that have, have died in combat. So he gets this idea that he wants to run this, um, this, ultra marathon, uh, in the, uh, that starts out in, uh, it's called the hurt 100. There we go. The hurt 100. Yeah. Okay. So it's called the hurt 100 and you run a hundred mile race through death Valley. And so that's what he's going to do in the summer to try and raise awareness <laughs> Not in, the winter, in the summer. Yes. Right. So that's what he wants to do, but you have to qualify for that race. So he, he through you know, some conversations and whatever, he finds out he's got to qualify and this, the race director tells him you've, you've got to at least have some, uh, you know, ultras under your belt in order to qualify. And then you still have to submit a resume and be accepted. So he finds out about this hundred mile, it's a 24 hour race, um, around a one mile track. And the guy says, you know, you could, you could try that and get a hundred miles. And so he goes and he does it. Basically, this conversation's happening in the week and the race is like Saturday, right? And so he's like, a couple days later, he shows up to run 100 miles in less than 24 hours. He takes a lawn chair, some crackers, and what, like some Myoplex. protein shakes or yeah. something? I forget what he had. Myoplex. Myoplex. Yeah. So and so, so not only that. Starts before, running, man. So before, before you start on that. Let's just prep with one other thing. So when he was deploying in Iraq, his idea um, of, of running was he did 20 minutes on an elliptical on Sunday. That's it. That's the only uh, aerobic exercise that he had done 
in the nine months before. Yeah. For the YouTubers, you can see this picture. That's him running this race that we're talking about. I mean, he's freaking 245 pounds and jacked. Like, this is not the 300-pound fat Goggins. This is the bodybuilder gar yeah. version of Goggins. Yeah, dude have been hitting the weights. Right. So he, he shows up with his freaking myoplex and crackers and starts running in circles. At some point, we're, I believe he's like 70 miles in. He, he stops and he sits in that chair. His feet are all busted up. He's like pissing blood. He's a, he's a wreck. But he's still got 30 miles to go. And he just is like, you know, it's the mental war that he came up against. And he's just thinking like, what in the hell am I doing? Like, I can't do this, you know. But. It was for the cause uh, that that foundation that that you referenced was a result of the worst SEAL deployment ever. And they I don't remember the mission, but but a whole bunch of people just, you know, they they were killed in battle. And so, you know, this uh, purpose kind of keeps with him. Right. And so he gets back up and runs. <laughs> Uh, oh, also he was, he was falling behind pace. He wasn't sure he was going to get a hundred miles in the allotted 24 hours. And so he gets up and he just freaking keeps going. And he, he finished 101 miles in under 24 hours. I think he was like, he quit after 18 hours or something like that and, uh, made it happen. And, and in the extra audio on the, um, audio version, he says that this particular race and moment was the hardest thing he has ever done. So out of the SEALs training and the future ultras that he does, which are even crazier, um, this one, he says, was the single toughest moment in his life. <laughs> yeah, so he finishes this, uh, the ultra marathon there in, in San Diego. Uh, the, the very first one, he literally almost kills himself. Um, his, his wife at the time, who's a, who's a nurse, takes him home, sticks him in the shower. They end up having to go, you know, to the, to the hospital, of course. Um, and he's, he, he's a bit messed up as anybody could imagine. Um, and then they had signed up for, uh, the Las Vegas marathon um, before he decided to do this, uh, the, the hundred mile race. And so, you know, he decides that, uh, you know, on his, his, his jacked up broken feet that, well, he's just going to go walk, um, the marathon in Las Vegas with his mom and his wife. Well, you know, the gun goes off something, something inside of him says, go, he ends up running the entire thing and actually qualifying, doing a time fast enough to qualify for the Boston marathon. So a week after, on broken feet, right on broken feet after he was literally, you know, pissing and shitting blood a week later goes and does another, a, another marathon and doesn't have time to qualify for the Boston. So, I mean, pretty nuts. Um, he then, uh, goes and does another ultra, uh, on Oahu, I believe. I don't remember if it was Kona or Oahu. No, it was, it was, anyway, he goes to Kona. Kona. Okay. All right. He goes to the Kona coast uh, on the big Island ends up doing, um, another ultra marathon. Um, some, you know, really good, crazy, crazy stories from that on how he completed it. Um, and then decides that, you know, it does some more emails back and forth, gets into the hurt 100 and, and then it's time to face that test. So with the, the Hurt 100, he actually had prepared for it. He had a, a somewhat of a game plan. So he did bring more than, you know, some crackers and, and myoplex uh, to, to go do this 100-mile um, torture test through the, through the desert of California and then having to climb, um, I believe it's 7,500 or 8,000 feet in, in elevation uh, towards the, the tail end of this 100 mile torture fest. Um, so he ends up completing it 
um, doing really well at first and then, you know, almost burning himself out. But, uh, but he, but he gets through it. And then he starts to think to himself again, okay, what can I actually accomplish? You know, if I actually really think ahead and not only train for these things, but have a strategy, what can I actually accomplish? And once again, that just blows me away. Right. So to me, like the, the, the pinnacle of my physical achievement would have been completing any of those. Right. But for him, once again, it's just another starting point for him thinking, oh, well, I've broken through those barriers. What can I actually do? And, and to me, that just, it blows my mind. Right. Like, like not man, I've done some great stuff, but how high can I go? Like, at what point will my mind or body stop? Like, that's what he's, that's what he's curious to hit. You know, (laughs) it's crazy. Like, like just, and and what a question, like how high can I actually go? What can, one of the, the few things I actually wrote down with by hand after one of his races, he says, what am I actually capable of? And um, that's quite the the question. But, you know, I mean, he's he's talking about physical stuff. Throughout this book, he continually goes back to being the hardest man ever that, you know, wants to be like the toughest Navy SEAL that ever walked. And, you know, uh, but for all of us who are not SEALs or ultra runners, it's like, how high can you go in business? How great can you make your marriage how um like mentally what can you do with your brain and your mindset like if you want to become super educated or uh industrious or whatever it is right like how high can i go what am i actually capable of and to to have a mindset like that um is just i mean that's the right question how what am i actually capable of uh, i thought that was an, a powerful quote for sure. And, uh, you know, another thing that he talks about is the, uh, what if, you know, what if I try this, you know, what can I accomplish? Right. What if I give it a shot? What if I, tr- what if I push through? Exactly. So then, he, so then he starts thinking of other things because every year he wants to raise money for this foundation. Right. So then he later jumps into like setting a new pull-ups record. It's like, I'm going to set a new record. And uh, he, he decides to do that, to set a new record. I think he had to do 4,021 pull-ups to beat the record. And uh, he was training hard. He had a plan. He was doing things to, to make sure he was ready uh, to get the promotion, you know, to raise more money and everything. He, he had now become a little bit famous for these like superhero uh, you know, efforts, uh, people were giving him attention and he got on, you know, some national TV like stations to be like filmed while he's setting the record and raise awareness and all this stuff. And he goes into that and, uh, he starts steaming out too quick. He was going too hard. His hands are bloodied and blistered. Uh, his arms like jacked up, like all kinds of problems. Right. And he doesn't make it. So yet again, like one of those, like, I'm going to go to be the, I'm going to be the best ever. And then he, he fails to be the best ever, but what's he do? Freaking comes back, dude. He's like, I'm going to do it again. (laughs) And this time, no TV, none of that stuff, but you know, he failed, he failed publicly and now he's going to succeed in, in private basically. And he gets the, Guinness record book holder, uh, judge there again. And he, he fixes his mistakes, right? He, he gets a different bar, a different gym, different nutrition, um, sets himself on a different pace. So instead of trying to do like seven pull-ups a minute on the minute, he, he reduces it, um, try some different things, you know, and, uh, sure enough becomes the world record pull-ups holder, like the most pull-ups in 24 hours. So the guy just like that question about what, what am I actually capable of? He just, he, 
he never quits, man. He keeps finding another way to do something else to prove himself another way to challenge his mind, to challenge his body. And at every step of this journey, he's like taking inventory of what he's, what's holding him back. Right. And to maybe kind of wrap this up a little bit, he says, um, Early on, he, re he realized he was afraid of everything, right? And it was all these fears and insecurities that were holding him back. And it was sort of through this uh, physical challenge that he started to understand some of these barriers, things that were holding him back. And he started just facing everything. Eventually, he went back and faced his father. He was scared of swimming. He taught himself how to swim. And then, of course, did all this paratrooper training and sales training and not tying under the water. And I mean, he, he challenged that until it was like no big deal. Um, his fear of, you know, being in scene, right. That whole 300 pound body that was built to hide him. He became vulnerable. He became uh, a public figure. He started doing speaking events. He, uh, you know, wrote a book that shared a lot of his personal life um, and, and it's like what he did is faced every single one of his fears and to the point that he became like this calloused mind, as he says, and a calloused mind can work for you or against you. If it's calloused in a, a direction of like becoming shut off to the world, uh, you know, you, you're going to have a hard time connecting, but, uh, a calloused mind in that I face every one of my fears and take them head on. And to the point that, you know, what the title of his book can't hurt me, like nothing, nothing so far has gotten the best of him. Right. And uh, it's pretty damn inspiring. Yeah, it is. And uh, I'll, I'll just touch on one other thing real, real fast. So, you know, one of the titles of the chapters, you know, um, talks about how failure can empower you. And that's so true in the way that, uh, that he approaches life, right? So when he does fail, he uses that to empower himself, to make himself better. And, and that's such a, a strong concept that just because you fail, that's not it. That doesn't have to be it. What if? What if you can push through that and use that failure to empower yourself to become better, to actually accomplish that the next time around or the time after that? And, and, and that's really, I think, what I took from this book is that failure in something never has to be the end. You know, we all fail in things, but are you willing to get back on that horse to push through the, uh, the pain or suffering or whatever it is that you have to, in order to accomplish that goal, you know, and use that failure to actually push you through to accomplish it the next time around. I mean, how powerful is that? So powerful. Like, so failure, you know, uh, when you're looking short term or long term means a different thing, right? Failing at something once, is just an opportunity to learn. Right. And he talks about that in the military, they do an after action report on every mission. And it's where you identify the strengths that are to be built upon and the weaknesses and things that need to be changed for the next, uh, next time to cover your weaknesses. Right. And so one single failure is simply an opportunity to do an after action report and understand where you went wrong and where you went right. And so that you can do it again. Right. And so if you're thinking long-term, a single failure is just, that's nothing. That doesn't mean anything. It was, it was part of your education. You know what I mean? And so then the second time you try again, and even if you fail again, it's still part of your education uh, until you've got the capability uh, to succeed. Right. And so you, you really got to think of life as a, a long-term game, an infinite game. And, you know, failures along the way are simply stepping stones, moments to take assessment uh, and understand, you know, what went right, what went wrong and what you're going to do differently. 
So anyway, Ben, we've been at this for a long time now. We're well into the hour here. So uh, we're going to leave some for the reader to, to, to go read. I, this, this book, I mean, it's 360 pages and every page was wonderful. I thought so uh, I'm, I'm in a recent podcast. I was whining about books that are 260 pages of, and they only have 160 of content, but this one is not that way. In fact, the audio book added more content and it was still all fascinating. And so, um, you know, David Goggins, truly an inspiring person. Um, the things he's done, the races he's, he's run, the place he came from in life to the place that he's at right now, um, are, are just incredible. And, uh, after listening to the book, I, like every time I plugged in, man, I was like, I gotta go, I gotta go run. And I, it's funny, dude. I, I, I ran a lot more during the time I was listening to this book than I ever have in my life. <laughs> I was running like, I was running like six and eight out, eight mile runs on the regular, just which usually I run three miles every couple of days. And, and the, and while listening to this book, I was running six to eight miles every time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I believe it. I mean, he's just, he's an inspiring guy. And, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll sum up, you know, one of the things that I learned from this in this way is that uh, he talks about that he's always wanted to be uncommon among uncommon men. And, you know, when you really sit and think about that for a minute, that's, that's tough to do, right? I mean, you know, just to be the best of the best of the best among the best. And and that's really what he was striving. And he achieved that. And you know, what's interesting about it. He did it in, in ultra running is kind of what he's known for. And he's like the least um, ideal body for ultra running. Right. And, and he wasn't, he hasn't been the best either. Like in one of his races, he watched um, what's his name? Scheltzer or something set a world record. Right. And when he hit the world record, Goggins still had like miles and miles to go, right? Uh, and that guy was already done. Right. So what he yeah, did. 17 miles left or something, yeah. Yeah. And so what he did is he found a way to be uncommon, even though he wasn't the best in the world, right? Um, he's uncommon in his relentless pursuit for his, for, for finding his maximum capabilities right and uh so the way he's uncommon is also interesting right it's not like he's michael jordan or or you know michael phelps or whatever he he chose us he chose to excel in a sport that you know is not meant for bodybuilders he's 245 pounds and he goes into these ultra runs and stuff like that. He's in, he's doing pull-ups with this big frame and he's six foot two, you know, like, uh, he challenges himself despite the likelihood of failure to see if he can do it. And, um, it's just, it's just incredibly inspiring. Uh, we could probably talk for another two hours about Goggins and his book, but we're going to shut it down. Very, very, very cool book. Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Um, I'll, I'll, once again, I'll put the links in the show notes so that you can purchase that from Amazon, which we appreciate. And uh, we appreciate everyone stopping in to listen. We'll catch you guys on the next one.